everyone, and this is Battle Phoenix here, and today's review is going to be on a big one, and that happens to be the Shadow Hearts series released on the PS2. So far, they are only exclusive to the PlayStation 2, and they were all developed by a company called Scandoff, and there's a good chance you probably might not have heard of them before. I mean, the only game that they ever worked on outside of this series was a game on the Neo Geo Pocket Color called Faisley? I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, but that's what it looks like to me. But I'd figure I'd mention that just in case, because it's not very often I hear people talking about the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Now, there is another game that they did make before Shadow Hearts was released, and that was a game called Kodelka. Now, the reason why this is kinda connected to the series is because the character that showed up in this game also does appear in one of the games. But I will say one thing, I'm not going to be reviewing this game today. Maybe some other time. But anyways, I just wanted to give you some background about the company and what they worked on before this game. So in this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the first two Shadow Hearts games, and then the next episode will be about the last one. And I have a feeling this one is going to be kind of long, so get comfortable. So I think it's best that we start talking about the first game first, right? Well anyways, the first Shadow Hearts game is just called Shadow Hearts and it was developed by Scanoff, and it was published by Midway. And it was released in 2001 in North America and Japan. And for Europe, it came out in 2002. And it's a turn-based RPG that has a horror setting. I find that to be pretty interesting. The only games I can think of off the top of my head that are kinda like this would be Sweet Home on the Famicom, then there's Parasite Eve on PS1, and there's a slew of other things that does make this game very different, and we'll talk about here shortly, so first things first, let's take a look at the story. So the game takes place in China and Europe, and the year is 1913, one year before World War I. Now that's another thing that you don't hear too much about in video games is a game taking place around World War I, let alone an RPG. So recent news within this game, there has been a wandering priest that has been murdered brutally, and so it seems his daughter has ran away and has never been seen again. So after that, it cuts to a train ride in China, and you see one of the main characters, Alice Elliot, who is the daughter of the priest that has recently been murdered. And eventually you see a very marvelous looking gentleman, and he happens to have a very delicious sounding name, and that's Roger Bacon. So at first he seems like he'd be like a good guy, but then after that you see him just like tear up a bunch of poor fools. And he also tries to adopt Alice for his own means. But before he takes off, he is stopped by our protagonist named Rude Hero. Okay, that's not actually his name. That's just a predetermined name if you bother to look into the info of the game when you first start. But for real, his name is Yuri, and he happens to be at Harmonoxer, which is also known as a shapeshifter, who has been hearing some strange voices in his head for quite some time. So he just delays the inevitable and stops Roger Bacon right there and rescues Alice and they just jump off the train. And after that, they're in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, and despite getting off on the wrong foot, they're gonna have to travel together. Because one of the voices that Yuri hears in his head happens to say something about Alice and rescue, so that's one of the reasons why he wants to protect her, and not only that, but because he's not a complete douchebag. And that's where the journey begins, but of course they meet a lot of characters along the way, such as Shu Zen. He is an old sage that has been taught by Master Sifa, and he precedes his name with Ruler of the Nine Heavens, and he helps up Yuri and Alice when they are stuck in a village full of cannibals. And then the next character they meet is Margaret G. Zelly. Now it's pretty interesting to note that she was based after a historical spy that was known as Matahara, and she ends up meeting Yuri and Alice in Fang Tia when she was making an explosion to get away from the Japanese soldiers, but those two happen to get stuck in between it. And then another character they meet is Keith Valentine. He happens to be a part of a huge family filled with vampires, so he himself is also a vampire considering he can change into a bat. And believe it or not, the reason why he joins the party is because he was bored after being woken up after a long time. In fact, that's something I forgot to mention is that despite this game being very dark and gritty, it does have a lot of humor. So the last character they meet is Haley Brankett, who is an orphan child that happens to have ESP powers. And they meet him in London after stealing their wallet. So those are all the main party members in the game. And of course, they all have like their strengths, their weaknesses, and different skills techniques. And that's the basic of what you need to know about the story within this one. So the main gang is always running about, 
Because you have a lot of people doing their own ambitions, like the Japanese army, then there's a guy named Du Huai, and of course the one that I already talked about, Roger Bacon, who is actually named after the real life Roger Bacon, who was a 13th century philosopher. And that's one of the things that I like, is that this game does use a lot of real history backgrounds. Now the story may seem pretty basic, but the thing that makes it great, in my opinion, is the characters. I think a lot of them are pretty fun and have some very good dialogue. And you do get some very interesting backstories behind each and every one of them. Even some of the secondary characters have some pretty interesting stuff going for them. One of them, for an example, is the colonel of the Japanese army, Kawashima, and her subordinate, Kato. And lastly, I'll mention is that I really love the setting in this game. Not only because it's different for an RPG, but I think it just worked really well. So anyways, let's finally move on to the gameplay. So when it comes to the overworld, the game is pretty linear, where you just keep on moving on to more locations. And after leaving an area, you have a map screen to choose where you want to go. Very simple stuff. But later on in the game, you can go back to a lot of previous locations. Not all of them, but a good portion of them. And sometimes when you do go back to these locations, you can actually find hidden secrets or side quests. And even some extra character background. And in this game, there's random encounters. And now let's move on to the battle system. And this is the part that I find to be very unique. So it's turn-based, which is pretty self-explanatory. Same thing with health and HP. And then you also have SP, but what the SP does in this game is actually sanity points. And it usually goes down by one per turn, and when it reaches zero, your character will go berserk. And when that happens, they take actions on their own, and they don't get EXP if the battle is done. So it's not recommended for that to happen. Now, when it comes to the attacking, using items, or using magic, this is the part that I really like a lot. So a circle appears on the screen, which is called a judgment ring. So it sweeps around kind of like a radar, and you have different sections to hit. And if you hit the line with the section area, then you can get a hit. And there's a small red line, and that usually indicates like a critical or a more powerful hit. So not only is this very easy to understand, but I also find it to be kind of fun. It kind of feels like a mini game to attack. And I also find it to be pretty innovative because of how different it is. Although I have heard that the game Grandia has something similar to this, but I've never played those games, so I can't say much on that. But yes, I really do like this Judgment Ring mechanic. Not only because it's different, but I also find it to be pretty fun. And a lot of the characters have very unique abilities. Like with Yuri, he is a Harmonoxer, therefore he can use the power of fusion to change his form. And his fusions are based after elements like wind, water, fire, earth, light, and darkness. And you can acquire more of these fusions with these elements by going into the graveyard at a save point. Now there's a whole other thing I'll have to explain about the graveyard, but I'll get there in a moment. So all the other characters get their special abilities by leveling up. And they all have different abilities that do damage or some that are just supportive. So now, about the whole graveyard thing. So yes, you can access the graveyard by going to a save point. And in here, you're pretty much inside Yuri's subconscious. And when you see the gravestone that flash different colors, that lets you know that you can get another fusion by defeating a monster. And if you talk to these four floating masks, they can clear your malice. So what the Malice is, is basically, when you open up the menu and you see a jewel that says Malice, and usually it'll flash like different colors. When it's blue, you're pretty much clear, but once it gets darker and darker and more crimson red, that is when the Grim Reaper shows up in your random encounters. And the Grim Reaper embodies Yuri's dad wearing the fox mask, and if you try and fight him, you'll just get your ass kicked. So it's just best to run away. So that's why you gotta go to the graveyard so you can clear the malice so you don't have to keep on running into the Grim Reaper. Now, I'll be honest, the whole, like, malice thing did get kind of annoying, but it really wasn't the worst thing ever. Considering it's only a thing for the first half of the game, as for the second half, you pretty much never have to worry about it ever again. So it's not like you have to deal with this throughout the entire game. But one minor complaint I do have is that you're probably looking at this and thinking, where's the run option? You have to hold R1 and then you select it. I don't know why they couldn't have just put it underneath defend, but once you know that, you're good to go. But the first time I played this and I kept on running into the Grim Reaper, I was basically fucked. Well, only if I would have known that, but hey, at least I made it through, right? And as for status effects, that's also the same thing like every other RPG. You know, you have poison, paralyze, all that stuff. But because the Judgment Ring is a very important thing in this game, they do have status effects that will affect the Judgment Ring. Like ones that make the hit detections invisible, or even ones that make the spinner go really, really fast. 
And then there's the one that makes it like really, really small. But that one's not a problem for me because I can still see it fine. So that's all I have to say about the battle system and I really like it a lot. So now, let's move on to the graphics, and before you start thinking, well what about the controls? Well, this is an RPG, and everything is very self-explanatory, so I don't really need to say much about the controls. So now, as for the graphics, I think they look really awesome. So all the backgrounds are 2D pre-rendered backgrounds, kinda like a survival horror, which is a great fit for this game. And a lot of the backgrounds are really dark and gritty, which definitely suit the game as well. And because I love the setting so much in this game, it looks exactly what I would imagine for a horror RPG to look like. So when it comes to the background and setting, I love them a whole lot. Now when it comes to the cutscenes in this game, now I will admit, for PS2, this is not the best looking ever. And I can kinda understand that since it is a very early released PS2 game. But if I were to say one really good thing about it is that it definitely does look like a very beautiful looking PS1 looking game. So you're probably thinking that the game's cutscenes do look a little bit low budget, and yeah, they kind of do, but honestly, it doesn't really bother me that much. But the cutscenes do look very dark, as to be expected, so that's another good thing. And when it comes to the character designs, I also do really like them a lot. And on a random note, I always found that Yuri looked awfully a lot like Jean from Outlaw Star. But from what I've heard from an interview from the creator of the game, he actually said that the character design was based after Akira Fudo from Devilman, which is not only pretty awesome, but now that I think about it, that actually does make a lot more sense. But as for some of the enemy designs, a lot of this stuff looks pretty fucking creepy. Personally, I find it to be almost as creepy as something that was made by Shinji Mikami. So I'm sure as you noticed so far, there's a lot of pretty weird looking enemies, but by far the most weirdest fucking thing in this game has to be Rage and Vengeance Demon. I mean, just fucking look at this shit and tell me what you think. Looks like something that came out of the game Cho and Nikki. But anyways, with all the ridiculous shit aside, I do find that the character designs and monster designs are really well done. But as for the graphics overall, I do find them to be pretty awesome for what they are, especially for a horror related game. Now when it comes to the game's music, it's pretty fantastic. So not only do all the songs fit the tone really well, because there are a good mix of creepy sounding songs and of course you also get some atmospheric stuff, but you also do get some very nice sounding tunes. And there's a whole bunch of different varieties considering this game does take place in China and Europe. So you get some Asian culture sounding songs, and then you get some European sounding songs. I pretty much love most of the music within this game. There's really nothing much to say about that because I always like talking about the music in this game in some of my top 10 lists. But yeah, overall, the music in this game, I just love it a whole lot. Oh, but one last thing I should mention is that one of the composers for this game, Yasunori Mitsuda, also has worked on a lot of other games with fantastic music, like, like Xenogears, Xenosaga, and even Chrono Trigger, believe it or not. So, yeah, I think that might explain why this OST is so damn good. Now, when it comes to the game's voice acting, this is kind of a hard thing to say because, generally speaking, the voice acting is not very good. But it does have some pretty good moments here and there, and there is actually a pretty good cast here, but the thing is, there's not a whole lot of it to judge upon. The only part with detailed voice work in it would be the CGI cutscenes, and those side quests that give you details upon the character backgrounds. So anyways, let's take a look at the cast first. So Yuri is being played by Eric Stewart, which is pretty awesome because I actually really like Eric Stewart. And from the parts that he does speak, it does sound pretty good, but like I said, there's not a whole lot of it. Although I do remember in one part, he almost sounds exactly like Kaiba, which is pretty amusing. Then again, he also did play the voice of Kaiba from Yu-Gi-Oh! And then Alice is being played by Veronica Taylor, and she's a pretty good voice actor. And as here, she does okay, not great, but you know, okay. And then Margaret is being played by Maddie Bustein, who is definitely a really good voice actor. But the work that she did here was just kinda okay. And then Zhu Zhen is being played by Scotty Ray, and I have to say, he did do a pretty good job here. Unfortunately, like I said before, there's not a lot of his work being shown, but from what I have heard of it, it actually does sound pretty good. And then Keith Valentine is being played by Ted Lewis, and Ted Lewis is pretty good, but the only thing is, is that this voice is just fucking awful. 
But thankfully, he like never talks during the main story. He only has a voice in one of his side quests. And like I said, it was pretty bad. And lastly, I'll mention is Wayne Grayson actually plays two characters within this game. He plays Haley and Roger Bacon. So his voice work for Haley was just not that good. But his voice work for Roger was actually pretty damn awesome. In fact, I think he did the most voice work within this game. Not just because he was playing two characters, but I also mean that Roger just had a lot of lines being played. So overall, when it comes to the voice acting, it's very mixed, where you have a lot of, like, not very good voice acting, and then you have some pretty good ones, but there's just not enough of it. But another really fucked up thing about the voice acting within this game, during the battles, when your characters do attacks, it mixes, like, English and Japanese voice acting. It's really weird. But probably the most funniest shit I ever heard in this game. When you attack with Zhu Zen, and on his third hit, it almost sounds like he calls him an asshole. Listen closely. And now you'll never be able to unhear that. You're very welcome. But yeah, the voice acting is just very strange to begin with. Now, if you want to buy this game, this game usually costs about 40 to 50, sometimes even 60 dollars. It really depends on the condition and how complete it is. So generally speaking, this game is not really cheap, but I don't really consider it to be an expensive title either. It's kind of middle range. But I can understand some people thinking it's a bit much for a used game. And the game is not really common, it's not something I see all the time, but I have seen it from every now and then. But personally, I find this game is worth that price, at least for 40 or 50. 60 may be a little bit too much, but then again, when you think about it, you do pay $60 for a brand new game. But I think that all comes down to preference. So now, if I were to rate this game, I'm gonna give it a 9 out of 10. Now, you're probably thinking I'm being extremely generous here, but here's the thing though. As soon as I first played this game, I was fucking hooked onto it. Now like I said before, I found that the story, well, it isn't the most amazing story you'll ever hear in an RPG, but it's really the characters that make it great. And the setting of tone of course helps out with that. And of course it also has a very innovative battle system which I really like a lot. Some very well detailed graphics, and of course an amazing OST. I'd say if you were a fan of horror, but you also liked RPGs, this is definitely it. And just something else that I want to mention that really took me back was that when I first played this game and it was around the beginning of last year, it really reminded me of the time when I was really getting into Tecmo Deception for the first time. I know that's a really weird comparison, but I think it just had to do with the fact that they're both horror related games and the fact that I was also staying up really really late playing them hours and hours on end. And whenever I was not playing the games, their songs were stuck in my head all the time. So I don't know if that makes sense to any of you guys out there, but to me, that is another reason why I really love this game. So personally, if you like RPGs and you also like horror setting, then I can highly recommend this game. So now let's take a look at the second game in the series, which is called Shadow Hearts 2 in Japan, but over here it's called Shadow Hearts Covenant. The developers and the publishers are the exact same ones from the first game, but the thing that's weird about this one is that the company Scanoff actually changed their name. It was changed to Nautilus, I think that's how you say it, probably not. But either way, it's the same damn company. And it was released in 2004 in Japan and in North America. Europe got in 2005. Now one thing that was interesting when this game was released was that if you pre-ordered this game, you actually got a free copy of the first game along with it. And I'll say it right here, that is a pre-order bonus done right. And this game happens to be one of the very few PS2 games that requires multiple discs. Which is something I don't see too often on PS2 games. Anyways, let's get into the game's story. So the game takes place in the year 1915. So it's been a year and a half since the first game. So that means that World War I is in full effect, and the first character you see is named Karen, and she is a lieutenant officer in the German army. Her and the rest of the soldiers had to go to Dom Remy, and when they got there they got attacked by a huge demon, but she ends up surviving the attack, and as soon as she gets back to report, the general sends in a guy named Nikolai, and he has had experiences with demons before. So before they take out the demon, Karen and Nikolai have to go to a tower to retrieve a holy mistletoe which kills demons in a mysterious way. So the whole tower section is just a tutorial level, but after that, you have to go back to Dom Remy. And once you get there, the demon comes back, and he ends up showing off his true form, which happens to be da 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 Yuri from the first game. 
So he's back again, and so it turns out Nikolai is a traitor. So it turns out that he's a part of a cult called Savantes Gladio, which mostly consists of dark sorcerers. So now they're in a hostage situation, and there happens to be a child involved from the village. So things got even worse with the fact that Yuri ended up getting stabbed by the mistletoe. And after that, you get a flashback of what happens before the whole situation started. But Yuri ends up getting rescued by Karen and two other new characters. So one of them is Blanca, who is a wolf. And unfortunately, his owner was killed in that hostage situation. In case you don't know who it is, it was actually that kid, Gian, who was in there. And the other new character is Geppetto. And yes, you guessed it, he is a puppeteer. So he mostly helps out Yuri when he was staying in the village. And that's where the journey just continues on from there, but there's one thing I will explain, and this part might be considered as a spoiler, but it's not a spoiler to this game, it's gonna be a spoiler to the first game. But anyways, I'm just gonna say that right now, because I always try and keep these reviews spoiler free as much as possible, but to continue reviewing this game, it's kinda hard not to mention it there, so I'm just gonna let you guys know right now is that, yes, this game takes place after the bad ending of the first game. And to put it shortly, the bad ending mostly consists of Alice dying. And that's part of the reason why she's not really in this game. Anyways, that's the only spoiler thing I'm gonna say in this review. But I figured I'd mention it because I'm pretty sure you guys would probably be wondering like, Well, what happened to Alice? Well, there's your answer. So anyways, the most of the story is kind of like the first one where they're mostly on the run against these Savientes Gladio freaks. But at the same time, they're trying to get to Wales to go see an old friend of Yuri's so they can find out more about this holy mistletoe. And the game mostly takes place within Europe, but they do go to many other places like Russia, Japan, but most of it usually takes place in Europe. And there are plenty of other situations that do happen within the game, but I'm not gonna explain that here. But I will talk about the rest of the characters. So there's Joachim Valentine, who is actually the older brother of Keith. So he's another guy with vampiric powers, like, you know, turning into a bat and such. But he also happens to be pretty damn ridiculous because he's a wrestler, but at the same time he also thinks of himself as a superhero. <laughs> Who's that? And the forces of darkness descend in the name of justice, this fist! In the name of truth, these muscles! In the name of honor, this blood! Ha <laughs> ha! Champion of truth and justice, Grand Papillon, ready to fight all evil doers. If you can face the unfettered fury of my rippling muscles, then come on! Yeah, that's a thing that happens. And then there's Lucia, who happens to be a fortune teller. And despite her beauty and allureness, she can actually be very clumsy. And then we got Princess Anastasia, who is actually based after the real Princess Anastasia from the Rumnos family. So she's the Princess of Russia, and she wants to do anything to protect her country. And lastly, I'll mention is Karando Inagami. In fact, he was named after an actual Japanese spy. So he was once a bodyguard of the Kawashimas, and he ends up joining the party because they end up helping out his master. So that's the rest of the party characters that you can acquire. But there are other NPCs within the game that are also based after historical figures, like the Great Gamma, who is an actual wrestler. And then there's Thomas Lawrence, who is a British spy from World War I. And then there's Yoshiko Kawashima, who has also served as a spy in real life, although in this game she's actually just a kid. And yet people say that you don't learn anything from video games. Well, I beg to differ. Because I learned quite a few things about this game about history that I didn't know about. So I always really like the idea of adding history figures into a game. But anyways, before we move on, one thing I do have to address here is that this game still keeps a lot of dark tone from the first game, but definitely not as dark as that, considering this game adds a lot more humor elements. In fact, one part that I'll play right here, just because it's too fucking funny, is this. That is one giant pussy. That is one giant pussy. Yeah, that part's pretty great. But I'd say this game does have a good mixture of dark and lightness to it. Now yeah, there are a couple parts in this game where it does seem a little bit campy, but at least it didn't go overboard with it. And even then, it just makes it just good old harmless fun. So anyways, let's go talk about the gameplay. 
So the navigation is exactly the same thing like the first one where you just walk around in a town or a dungeon and then of course as soon as you leave you go into a map. So nothing much to say there. And here's something I forgot to mention in the first game, but because it is present here, I might as well explain it right here. So there are two guys that are always following you around going to every town that you go to, and they both act very over the top. But anyways, you buy stuff from them, like you know, like items, equipment, all that kind of good stuff. And when you shop there, you get credits. And what this credit does is that it allows you to get discounts off every percentage. And of course, when you want to go for a discount price, you have to do the Judgment Ring. Which can be very helpful if you want to save money, but of course, if you fail the Judgment Ring at this part, then you have to buy the item at full price. And the other guy at the stall allows you to upgrade Geppetto's weapon. Well, more like adds a different element to it, and of course you get a new magic spell out of it. So in the first game, you do get the whole discount stuff, but you have to do it at a random stores. But in the first game, you do get a character that does follow you around in most of the towns, and well, yeah, he does that very over the top as well. And I always find it to be pretty funny since they always like to hit on Yuri. Oh, and speaking of stuff that happened from the first game, Sergeant Kato is in this game, and this time he does not look like a generic NPC. In fact, it looks like he just got out of generic character purgatory. So remember kids, be careful who you make fun of in middle school. I just felt like mentioning that one. So anyways, let's move on and talk about the battle system. So it's very similar to the first game where you get the same amount of options, and of course you also do get the judgment ring, all that good stuff. And of course all the characters have different abilities, where Yuri still has the power of fusion, Karen uses sword art, Geppetto uses special magic attacks that no one else can use. In fact, those spells will get stronger every time you collect a stud card. In case you're wondering what a stud card is, it looks like this. Yeah, this is definitely reminding me of Cho and Nikki, very much so. And then Blanca has a special attack called Manifestation, and those attacks will get better once you get into a wolf battle. And basically a wolf battle is when you have Blanca fighting against another wolf. So whenever you find a random wolf, you can actually fight it and you get more special abilities out of it. And Jolchim is kind of a weird one where basically he's a very strong type of character and he does use some interesting magic spells. But sometimes he'll just randomly transform into a bat and when that happens, basically his health is much lower and he's not as strong. So I always found him to be pretty tough to use because the transformation is always unpredictable. And then Lucia has the ability to use tarot cards. Now this skill is very risky because sometimes you can get a card that can be very helpful or sometimes you can get a card that could just completely fuck you over. But she also does use special items that can only be used by her and basically they're aromas and when you mix them together they can use like support abilities. And then Anastasia has the power to analyze things by taking a picture of it with a camera. But there are some enemies where you take a picture of them, you can actually absorb their power and can use the picture to summon them. Unfortunately, there's not many enemies that you can absorb power into, but I will say for sure is that the enemies that you do absorb can be very fucking powerful. And then Corondo cannot do any magic at all, but he also does have the power of fusion, much like Yuri. So all the playable characters definitely do have their very unique abilities. And there's many different playstyles to choose from. In fact, one thing I always found to be very helpful within this game is that you can actually change your party on the fly by making different types of parties. Like Group A, Group B, and Group C, and you can assign any number of them. And of course, if you press L2, you can just change it automatically. And there's a new mechanic called the Crest System. So pretty much every character can use crest magic except for Yuri and Karando. So every magic crest you get has certain magic spells within them and you can equip them to one of those characters. But each character can only equip a certain amount since they all have a DCP. So once the DCP is maxed out, you can't equip any more to that character. And I really like this system because it really adds more creativity within characters and also allows you to play the game however you want. And one awesome thing that they added is ring customization. So in the first game, if you want to attack something, you have three hits. But in this game, you can have characters have more hits. The maximum amount is five. And you can make the hit markers bigger and the strike markers, which I think is a really nice upgrade from the first game. And you also have status effects on your basic attacks now. And of course, you can equip them with any character you want. And you can also change the way how the Judgment Ring works, where you have like Gamble, which makes it harder. Or there's also the Practice Ring, which makes it easier. But personally, I always just leave it on default. So I think they definitely added a lot more customization in this game, which I think is awesome. But one new thing they did add to the battle system itself 
Now you can make combos with different characters. So you can either just select the option to make a combo with another character, or if two characters just happen to be right beside each other, then you can make bigger combos to make bigger damage. But if you do decide to make a combo, you can choose do nothing or you can choose defend. So if you do nothing, you're basically risking yourself from getting hit and then your combo will break. But if you use defend and someone attacks you, then your SP gets lowered. And the SP works exactly the same way like it does in the first game. And yes, in this game they got rid of that malice thing. But one more thing that's different about the battle system this time is that whenever you do a standard attack, you can actually choose different options. Like their standard, hard hit, aerial hit, and then knockdown. And some enemies are better or worse against some of these options. So because there are different types of hits you can make in the game, character and enemy placements can pretty much happen all around the field, which is why sometimes when a character is right beside another character, you can do combos like that. So I think that takes care of the new additions to the battle system. And all I can say here is that I definitely like it so much better in the first game, and that's saying something because I really love the battle system in the first game. I mostly like it for the customizations that you can do. So now, as for the last thing I'll say about the gameplay is that the progression of the game is still the same, but I still like it a lot, mainly because I like finding all the different secrets and all the different side stories as well. And the way they did the Grave Druid is pretty much the same thing, although this time you can actually upgrade the demons by putting in your soul power and every fusion can get up to level 10. So yeah, I think that covers pretty much everything about the new elements. So I don't know about you, but I think they added quite a lot of new things, which is definitely a good thing. So now let's move on to the other stuff, like the graphics. So the graphics this time are still really nice looking, but they don't use 2D pre-rendered backgrounds anymore, instead everything is just full 3D. Now, as much as I love the pre-rendered backgrounds because it really looked like a survival horror game, but even with this new style, I still think it looks great. But like I said about the story not being as dark as the first game, the graphics are very much like that as well, where it is still very dark, but not as much as the first game. But there are still a lot of very nice looking backgrounds, so I'm not complaining. And as again, I really do like the character designs as well. Although I do kind of prefer Yuri with his brown jacket, but the one with the black outfit still looks pretty cool looking. But all the rest of the characters look great as well, and especially the fact that Kato definitely got a big upgrade. And the CGI cutscenes definitely do look a lot better. So overall, when it comes to the graphics, for the most part, I do like them better than in the first game, but of course the first game will definitely have its charm with its 2D pre-rendered backgrounds. And with the overall grittiness to it, it will always have a special place in my heart. But for the most part, I can't complain whatsoever. Now, when it comes to the game's music, just like the first game, it's pretty damn fantastic. So a lot of the songs definitely suit the theme of the game, which is great. And you definitely do get a lot of variety, like creepy sounding stuff, some atmospheric stuff, and even just some beautiful sounding tones, and even some epic sounding ones. So pretty much a lot like the first game. But as much as I love the music in this game, I do have one minor complaint about it. There are two songs in this game that they reuse so many times in this game, it actually got kind of tiring, and it was a shame because there are two songs that I definitely liked a whole lot. So one of them is Town of Twilight, which pretty much plays in every single town within Europe, and the other one is In the Darkness of a Labyrinth, and I really like it for how atmospheric it is. But it plays in like almost every single dungeon. Now, in some dungeons I can kind of understand it being there, but then there are some where I kind of figured like, why couldn't they just use a different song? Now obviously, this is not a game killer for me, but it is something that definitely could have been improved upon. In fact, that's one reason why I do like the OST of the first game better, was because every single town had its own theme. Same thing with most of the dungeons as well, where in this game they just reuse a whole bunch. In fact, one thing that I thought was really disappointing was that in the last area of the game, they just reuse the regular battle theme when you're in Japan. Now that song is alright, but it's kind of weird to use it in a final dungeon. Where in the first game, you actually had three different songs that played in the final dungeon, and two of them were fucking epic. But other than that, the music in this game is still awesome. I just prefer the ones in the first game just a little bit more than this one. Now, when it comes to the game's voice acting, this one is definitely a bigger improvement for a number of reasons. Well, first things first, it definitely has a lot more voice work. The cast is definitely bigger. And I'd say the overall cast is done better. In fact, one thing that I just found out about was that the voice director was actually Richard Epcard, which is one of my favorite voice actors. 
Now, unfortunately, he does not play a character in the game, but the fact that he was directing all the voice actors, that's definitely a pretty good thing. So, this time around, Yuri is being played by Joe Capelti. Now, I'm not really familiar with his work, but what he had to do with Yuri's voice, I thought it was handled pretty good. Although, I do kind of prefer the work that Eric Stewart did, even though there was very little of it, but from what I can tell, I thought it was actually a lot better, but of course, Joe Capel definitely did a pretty good job with it. And then Karen is being played by Carrie Welgren, and I think she does do a really good job here. And then Geppetto is being played by Amos Nandi, I have never heard of this guy before. But he actually plays three people in this game, and one of them just happens to be Geppetto, and I think he did do a pretty good job with it. It's kind of unfortunate, it was the only roles that he ever did. I would have been curious to hear more. And then Joel Chim Valentine is being played by Paul St. Peter, which I find to be pretty hilarious because he's actually a really good voice actor, and he usually does do a lot of serious roles, so hearing him acting like a wrestler superhero is it's just really funny, and I think it was done well. And then Lucia is being played by Michelle Ruff, which is also a really good voice actor, and I think she did do a pretty good job here, it's just unfortunate that she barely ever talks throughout the game. But at least Michelle Ruff has played a couple other characters in this game, so that's all well and good. And as for Blanca and Corando, they're actually played by the same guy. And that happens to be Richard Consigno, and I think he did do a pretty good job with Corando. But I found him to be just okay as Blanca, but then again, Blanca also doesn't really talk, except for when you're into a wolf battle. And then Anastasia is being played by Stephanie Say. And I think she's a pretty good voice actor, and I think this role was definitely a good one for her. And finally, I'll mention is that you do get some other really good voice actors here, like Bob Preppenbrook, Michael Sorge, Kirk Thornton, and even Jameson Pierce, who all do a really great job in their roles. So I think the voice acting here is definitely a big improvement over the first one. But of course it does have its cheesy moments, but hey, that's all well and good. Now if you want to buy this game, usually this game goes about $30 to $50. It's usually a bit less expensive than the first game. So it's good that this one is actually a bit more easier access, although of course I still don't see it very often. So at least this game is not outrageously expensive. Although, there is a lot of sealed copies on eBay as of right now, and of course a lot of them are like pretty expensive, but hey, at least it's guaranteed that the game is gonna work. But if I can say one thing, is that this game is definitely worth the price. Now, as for the final part, and that happens to be the score, and if I were to rate this game... You know, before I reveal the score, this is gonna be pretty tough, because... I do like this game better than in the first one, but at the same time, there are some things about the first one that still have their charm, and I do like a little bit better. And also, in my game reviews, I've never given a game a 10 out of 10 so far. And I think a part of the reason why I've never done has to do with the fact that judging games is definitely a lot different than judging anime or movies. Because there's a lot more involved with games compared to movies and anime. But if there's one thing that makes all of them common, it has to do with the fact that everything will always have its flaws no matter what, if they're big or small. So you know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna give this game a 10 out of 10. Now before someone tries to say that I'm like a total fanboy of this series, well, for one, if you haven't been listening, I already did fault this game for a couple things. Like reusing the same songs like a shitload of times, and the fact that I like the gritty atmosphere of the first game a bit better. But these are all minor things, where everything else about the game is pretty fucking awesome. And of course, just because I give something a 10 out of 10 doesn't mean that it's like absolutely perfect and that it's like better than everything out there in the world. But this game definitely held my interest for the entire playthrough. And the battle system was a huge improvement from what was already very fun. And it also works as an amazing follow-up from a great game. I mean, if you played one, you really have to play the other, because they really do go together like bread and butter. And I'd easily put this up there with some of my favorite RPGs on the PS2, which there's a lot of great ones on there. Hell, I'd even say it's one of my favorite RPGs of all time. I'd even rank it up there with some of my other favorite ones, like Chrono Trigger, Xenogears, Lunar 2, Final Fantasy 6 and 9, Dragon Quest 8, and even some of the Shin Megami Tensei games. I'd rank it up there with one of those. But of course, that's just my personal opinion. And I know I've said this in my anime reviews before, but just don't take the 10 out of 10 score too seriously. Like I said, the game is obviously not perfect, just like anything in this world. It was just highly entertaining for me, and it made a lot of improvements on something that was already great. So like I said a bunch of times before, this game just kicks ass and I love it a whole lot. And if you really like the first game, then this one is definitely a must. Now before we end it, there are two other related things with this game that I figured I might as well mention. 
So in Japan, they did make a director's cut version of the game, and it added quite a bit to the game, like new areas to explore, new weapons and costumes, and even two playable characters that are actually boss characters, which I thought was pretty awesome. And a whole slew of newer cutscenes, and even has the support of the PS2 HDD. But unfortunately, this was all exclusive to Japan. But if you can read Japanese text, I can definitely say that this would definitely be worth your while. And lastly I'll mention is that they even made a manga after this game. As again, I would have been all over that if I'd known about it, but the only thing is, it's also only released in Japan. So as again, if you know how to read Japanese text, this would definitely be interesting. Or even do a fan translation of it, that would also be pretty awesome. So that'll take us to the end of this video. Where so far, this is Yuri's story. So in my next review, we're going to be taking a look at the next game in the series, although it is kind of considered as a spin-off now, and that happens to be Shadow Hearts from the New World. So stay tuned for that one next time. So that being said, thanks for watching and commenting. Ooh.